and welcome to the Healthy Half Hour Podcast. We are your hosts, Richard and Karen Inslee. The Healthy Half Hour Podcast is your resource for all things healthy, and we will be discussing how to make nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle choices work for you. We will be sharing our own personal insights along with research gathered from working in the health and fitness industry for the past 10 years. Our show is brought to you by The 7 Day Shred, which can be found at 7dayshred.com. And please feel free to visit our podcast website, which can be found at healthyhalfhourpodcast.com. And now on to today's show. Hello and welcome back to the Healthy Half Hour Podcast. Today we're going to talk all about fat. Not the fat you eat, the fat you carry. So that's going to be today's topic and we're going to go into what it is and how to get rid of it and or reduce it or make yourself look better from inside and out. So before that, we had a question last week from our Metabolism Podcast And at the start of the podcast, we were kind of talking about metabolism and a lot of the times that people don't eat enough and it kind of trashes your metabolism. And then later on in the podcast, what we actually said was one thing that can help your metabolism or the cells from a metabolic rate is actually to eat less. So it was kind of a bit of a an oxymoron because we were telling you one thing and then telling you the opposite to actually fix it. So basically what we were saying really what happens which doesn't help people's metabolism is that they eat under eat chronically a lot of the times with again processed foods low nutrient dense foods for long periods of time eating a thousand or 1200 calories which is probably way under their metabolic balsam balsal metabolic rate for their size and so what happens is this actually slows the metabolism down because you're not getting all those nutrients that you need in your system that we spoke about So if you were eating kind of a more nutritionally dense diet, then eating a little less calorically can be a metabolic advantage for you because, again, the cells are getting all the things they need in there. So they're getting all the fuel and everything and all those nutrients and vitamins that help those enzymatic actions. So, yes, that's kind of the either end of the spectrum with eating less kind of trashes your metabolism but eating less can help your metabolism because again it's more from a cellular level and you've Uh, got to you if you want to lose weight it's eating a calorie deficit but people chronically under eat that's what you were getting at isn't it yeah and that's that's the point like i say it's in it's what you're eating that makes the big difference so if you are have been under eating for long periods of time and again not necessarily a nutritionally dense diet then as we spoke about, you need to kind of bump those calories up in that reverse dieting process for a while, just again, to get your metabolism back online, to get things moving again, to get the system used to having the full spectrum of nutrients, vitamins, minerals and everything, to get everything kick-started up and then, again, reduce that nutrient-dense diet down a little bit. Again, keeping the nutrient density, but reducing the calories in there, which can be done, again, just by maybe eating a little less added fats, um, a little less uh, carbohydrates from sources that, again, that are nutrient-dense, but that obviously you can mitigate those calories a little bit just to get you in that caloric deficit. And another point that was raised as well with that metabolic issue that people have was thyroid so rather than tackle the thyroid question what we're going to do is next week's or next podcast we're going to do is going to be all about the thyroid so we're going to talk about hyperthyroid hyperthyroid and everything to do and how it affects the metabolism it might even stretch to two podcasts i mean because it's a big it's a big topic it can be a big topic and it seems to be something that a lot of people do suffer with and they're obviously ending up on medications to enhance their thyroids and again it can be an age thing tendency more with females than males but again we'll talk about that in the next one just to tease you a little bit Ooh. <laughs> so with this podcast again we're going to talk about body fat so again we're talking about stored fat so why do we store body fat well we store body fat because it's a fuel source and your body may need that fuel source at some point in the future 
And as we've said before, from an evolutionary point of view, we when excess calories are around, our bodies are pre-programmed to take on those excess calories and store them because at some point there may not be excess calories. We kind of still live 10,000 years ago in our bodies, but society has moved on at way faster rates than we do. So your body doesn't know there's a safe way or sobies on every corner. And so there's an excess of calories which are available to obviously more of the Western population than other populations through the world. And those ex- excess calories are stored purely because for extra fuel. So if you get again, think 20, 30, 40,000 years ago, we're wandering across the savanna. Nobody needed a six pack. Nobody cared. All it was about was survival. I need a six pack. Beer? <laughs> no, I don't drink beer. Oh. <laughs> so it wasn't all about, again, looking good. It was about survival. So if they came on uh, some fruit trees or they came on, a, uh, they killed an animal or something, it was eat as much of it as you can in one large bolus or as over a couple of days until it either ran out or the fruit went rotten or whatever happened and again you could store that body fat up for use at a later date and as I say the problem is now that later date never comes one analogy I like to use again with stored body fat it's like thinking of a truck like a semi truck tractor trailer and it's got 30,000 liters of fuel on the back of it and it's going to deliver the fuel And the guy sat at the side of the road because his fuel tank on the side of his truck, which actually makes the engine run, has ran out. So if you think about that, he's got lots and lots of fuel on board, but his actual fuel substrate he's actually using in the truck is empty. And he can't access it. And he can't access it because he can't pipe it. And that's basically what a lot of people are up against. They're running their their fuel tank down that actually they're utilizing, which again tends to be uh, blood sugar, uh, tends to be muscle sugar and tends to be um, liver sugar. And those fuel substrates are nice and easy for the body to convert into energy so we can actually utilize it. But the difficulty is, is all that stored fuel, like it's in the back of the fuel tanker, is difficult to access because, again, people aren't putting their bodies or their metabolisms in the right frame in the right position to actually utilize that body fat or the mobilizing that body fat and not utilizing it for energy which again we're going to talk about in a while and when it comes to body fat most people will jokingly say to us like oh just suck all of the fat out of my body but if actually if you emptied all the fat out of your body you'd actually die it's it's very like instrumental to health and the thing is, you can't actually get rid of your fat cells. They do have like a, a shelf life. They take about 10 years to die, but they actually all get replaced. So you do need that body fat, but we need to work on ways to manipulate how we use that uh, fuel source and how big those fat cells get. And again, from a fuel source point of view, when it comes to fat levels in humans, women will have more fat than men. Yay. Purely because they're baby makers. Uh, And again, going back to thousands of years ago, if there was a shortage of fuel, then the woman need to know that they can have more fuel stored because it takes thousands and thousands and thousands of calories to make a baby. Uh, The guy's part in the whole thing was done in 10 seconds, nine months previous. (laughs) So, I mean, yeah, we don't need to do that. I mean, we need to store fat from a from an energy point of view. So, I mean, the average men's fat should be around 18 to 19%, and most women should be around the mid-20s. So, from that point of view, some women, we've had clients we've tested, and they've been women have been 9% fat, but that's genetically, that's just who they are. They don't store a lot of body fat. So, I mean, from that point of view, yes, we need to have a certain amount of fat. So one thing, again, with fat cells is to think of fat cells like a bank account. You've got to put some in and you've got to take some out. So a bank account never, unless it's a savings account, you're never going to use. It's never static. So there's money coming in, there's money coming out. But again, a lot of the times with people's fat cells, there's more money coming in than actually going out. I mean, we'd love a bank account like that, but we haven't got one of them either. (laughs) So when you actually look at... We're in the wrong industry for that. (laughs) Yeah. Love will pay our money. I know, yeah, it's a good job we love what we do. (laughs) So with that actual, the the ins and the outs, there's actually one way of 
fat coming out of fat cells, which is lipolysis, and there's two ways it can come in, which is de novo lipolysis, which is basically making fat from carbohydrates, and there's also re-esterification, which Ooh, is... a big word. I don't know, for, especially for today. <laughs> so with re-esterification, you've got lipids going around in your bloodstream that can actually be utilised for energy. They don't get utilised for energy, so they turn back into triglycerides again, and they're stored in the body. These three mechanisms are actually controlled by hormones. And the, the big ones we're going to look at today are insulin and cortisol. So just because you want those fat cells to be mobilized, just because you think I need that six pack or I need to get thin, uh, your brain really doesn't have a lot of control over this. It's actually the inputs we actually utilize with what we do, what we eat, how we exercise. And again, where you are, especially from a female point of view, kind of in your life cycle of hormones. So again, what the the cells, the fat cells are looking at is inputs we're putting into our body also, and then the hormones will react and then the hormones react to pull that fat out. So it's like your car, uh, unless it's a Tesla or one of these self-driving cars now. Or well, you don't know, ca- somebody died. True. <laughs> All a car will basically sit there until you put inputs into it. So it's actually looking for you to put it into gear. It's looking for you to turn the engine on. It's looking for you to press the gas pedal, press the brake pedal. It's looking for you to use the signals, which nobody knows how to do here. And or use also, the mirror. Uh, mirror? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, that vehicle is looking for inputs and it'll just sit there and not do a whole heap of beans until it gets those inputs. So your fat cells, a lot of the times are pretty much doing the same because, again, even though it's a bank account in and out, what comes in and what goes out is controlled not directly by what you do, but how you manipulate those hormones to do it. And obviously in our industry, we see a lot of people working out and actually doing bodybuilding competitions. But we don't see it as much now, but a lot of people used to bulk before, like to build all this muscle. But if you actually eat more than you need to survive and build muscle, then you will gain fat mass. And that fat mass, those fat cells, will actually get bigger. And then when they get to full capacity, you will actually... Um, make more fat cells like yeah everybody wants to make more in some ways that is not necessarily a bad thing because if you may if you have all that energy surplus and there's not new fat cells made to accommodate it then that energy surplus will spill over into your bloodstream in the form of triglycerides and um, free fatty acids and glucose which obviously you can then develop into type 2 diabetes and you will make new fat cells if those fat cells in your body are maxed out and you're overeating and over consuming and you won't actually get rid of them unless of course you do something like liposuction and one thing to note with that is a lot of the times again these fat cells can be made and like karen said earlier on they're not destroyed they're not they're not got rid of so i mean what happens with kids who end up overweight and i mean the parents oh it's just johnny's puppy fat he'll get over it well i'm afraid johnny won't Now you've just saddled Johnny with extra fat cells for the rest of his life. And you've only got to look at the childhood obesity statistics to know that it's an epidemic. And now they're predisposed, again, because now they've got all those little wallets they can put extra cash in, so they eat a little bit more. And so that wallet of fat cells now has just got bigger, so there's now more, there's more to put in. And again, fat cells have a hormonal value of their own, so now there's more signaling coming on because there's more fat cells. So there's more fat cells shouting, me, me, me. And again, it's a slippery, slidey slope. And I was uh, making some notes last weekend for this um, week's podcast. You're very studious. <laughs> I am very studious. I was I was the studious one at school. You were the one that was messing around. People can tell I wing it. <laughs> and I was actually making notes about the Biggest Loser um, show. And... Then I saw something on Facebook or Instagram the other day, and it was actually an article on the biggest loser contestants over the however long it's actually been on the air as to how many have actually keeping the weight off. And the one thing with the biggest loser is if you've, I mean, I'm sure that there's like nobody that hasn't heard or seen the show, is if you've lost a lot of weight. If you've had a big amount of weight to lose, people say like, oh, like I, I put it all back on and some, and I don't know why. Well, basically, if you lose a big amount of weight and empty your fat cells, 
then you've got a lot of cells around them that actually can sense like how full those fat cells are. So if there's lots of empty fat cells, your leptin levels will be low and your leptin signal like will be dysregulated. So leptin is what tells you to stop eating. Basically, it tells you that you're full. And leptin basically says that you've got enough fat stores. And when you've lost a big amount of weight, then those leptin signaling, that leptin signaling will be like down regulated and hence the weight comes back again. So a lot of the times those contestants on The Biggest Loser, they lost all that weight and there was a few I saw in the article that kept it off, but the majority of the ones that kept it off were the ones that made some significant lifestyle changes. Even some of them went into personal training and um, like professions like that, and they're the only ones that kept it off. Lifestyle changes? <laughs> They'll never catch on, will they? <laughs> and the more body fat that you actually have, the more insulin resistant you will be. And... We've talked about fat before and we've got like subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. The subcutaneous fat is the fat underneath our skin. So for women especially, it's all that orange peel, like um, cellulite appearance. So though those like subcutaneous fat levels, actually the subcutaneous fat levels remain very constant and pretty level, but our visceral fat is the fat that surrounds our organs. So if you have a lot of visceral fat that can't be detected unless you go to a specific trainer or facility to actually have like the calipers done and your visceral fat checked, then that visceral fat can actually increase and decrease in size very, very rapidly. And basically what's going to happen is like things like your heart muscle could get strangled and that's where that skinny fat terminology comes from. People feel like, oh, I can eat whatever I want and I'm not going to put uh, weight on. And the number on the scales is not always an important one. So you might look reasonably slim, but you could actually be um, holding quite a lot of visceral fat in your body. And again, you don't want to lose weight. People want to lose fat. Yeah. And I mean, there's a big difference between weight and fat. Uh, obviously, fat is part of that weight, but I mean, weight covers a whole lot of other things like obviously muscle mass, bone mass and other things. So again, the, the goal is to get that fat mobilized out of the cell uh, to actually utilize it as an energy source. And Richard mentioned a little bit earlier about like hormones, and we were talking about this earlier before we sat down to record the podcast about women in their like 40s, 50s, women who have gone into menopause. And I went I, I must be the only female probably that is actually happy that I'm now in menopause and I was actually thinking about it the other day like well what what happens now I don't, I don't even know what's actually going to happen but basically in tw- early 2014 um, a stressful event like kind of pushed me into menopause and then 2015 my health completely and utterly tanked and I actually gained about 16 pounds in weight, which I'm only five foot two. So like even five pounds on me looks like significant. And although I work professionally to help people with their health and like weight management, it didn't matter what I did. I just could not like shift the weight. And then we've mentioned it a couple of times before, and we're not going to harp on about this, but it's just relevant to the podcast in that I did a 44 hour in, um, modified water fast in January when we got back from our trip to the UK. Uh, you might think 44 hours is a short period of time, but I literally was to the point where I, I could have like chewed my arm off. I was so hungry. <laughs> but I actually dropped those 16 pounds in as little as eight weeks. And I'm probably, I'm 17 pounds down now. And I'm maintaining that from February But the one thing that I did manage to do, Richard said earlier that a healthy body fat percentage for a female is mid um, 20s, so about 25. And I was 25 point something body fat. And those two small modified water fats actually helped me to bring my body fat down to like the late 21s now. So metabolically, um, the, the water fats helped, but it also helped with my body composition and body fat levels, which was good. So again, we've, like say, we were chatting about this beforehand, 
And really, from looking at the angle of what Karen's coming from, we just kind of put our heads together and probably a couple of different things happened. She may have been a little bit uh, insulin resistant. So again, she's not insulin saying do this and do that and the body's kind of ignoring it. And one of the things, again, with that one thing you can do uh, with uh, regard to like fat loss that doesn't affect insulin um, is fast. Because again, your insulin's not really affected. The only thing insulin affects with fasting is ketone levels. So again, you need insulin to keep ketone levels regulated and not go too high because again you don't want to have ketoacidosis which is poisonous to the body so with that that could have been one thing that happened or like we've said on last week's podcast it could have just been that metabolic reset because her system once you drop into that fasting mode as we spoke about in the fasting podcast your cells actually start to scavenge and it'll actually cells that are not in good condition will actually start to die off there may be parts of those cells that are good maybe like golgi tendon organs or maybe some of the mitochondria or some of the all the smaller parts in those cells that can be scavenged and your body will utilize them but once that happens you'll end up with better cells once you start to refeed yourself so again there's a lot of different really good metabolic things come from fasting and again we went over a lot of this in the fasting podcast so that's one of the things again we were looking at and like i said earlier on with that insulin that's one of the drivers of the in and out of the fat cells so again just dropping that maybe that reducing that insulin sensitivity in her just help that process of getting the 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 fat out of the cells to actually get a metabolism kicked up and that fat utilization going and we're also talking this morning weren't we about women menopausal and we've uh, talked a lot today haven't we we have yeah Yeah. actually we we had a conversation we didn't even walk to the mailbox no no it's it's our wedding anniversary tomorrow so we went out last night so we actually like been having a conversation right yeah yeah. we'll never catch on eh no (laughs) ignore you for another year now yeah okay yeah (laughs) so we we were talking about menopausal women and women in their 40s and 50s and hormonally they are at a disadvantage with like naturally not having obviously high testosterone levels because we'd have beards and talk like this with a deep voice like grew <laughs> see i got it back round to this fickle on me without even trying oh, God. <laughs> and our estrogen levels um are dropping so if you're in menopause already and you are overweight then you are at a disadvantage aren't you yep you are and to to add uh, insult to injury <laughs> if you're stressed then you're at more of a disadvantage because, again, the other hormone I mentioned earlier on was cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And, again, we did a couple of podcasts on cortisol way back when. And those stress hormones do have an effect on how fat comes in and comes out of the cells because from that point of view, I mean, it's very... Cortisol is very uh, catabolic and it will not help with that fat process so again if you're menopausal and you're stressed and then you wonder why you can't lose body fat those input signals that you send in your body are basically being read as we've got problems we need to hang on to this body fat because again we're stressed that things are happening and we need it as an energy source and a lot of the times people we've obviously done podcasts on this like try to exercise their way out of a a bad diet but a lot of like women who head into menopause if they're already holding like some excess weight they overtrain and metabolically that's the worst thing that we can do because it's another stress that will raise cortisol on the body so you need to do enough exercise to elicit a stress response but not to the point where it creates inflammation and i say if you're already overweight going into menopause then the disadvantages are there unfortunately and you can't exercise your way out of that situation no and i say doing more and more and more and going harder and harder and harder thinking you're going to lose body fat like karen says is so just counterproductive because it just increases those stress levels and all you'll end up doing is burning those sugar levels and a lot of the time to fuel your next workout as in if you're running or whatever and you're running hard then again you need to carb up because otherwise you won't be able to fuel those workouts so the next time you go all you're going to do is tank so again, what we spoke about or been speaking about is trying to get those fat stores mobilized. And again, again, that's what you need to be. You need to be a fat mobilizer and a fat burner. 
So from a dietary point of view, if you just keep feeding yourself tons of carbs, which is the easier fuel source for the body to metabolize, then your body's going to keep saying, oh, I'm just going to keep, keep, keep the body fat levels I've got. If you eat too much food, then the body's going to take that food and store it because, again, it doesn't want to have those fatty acids or those sugars, too many sugars floating around the bloodstream because, again, it's not healthy for us. So to get fat mobilized, we do need to be in a slight caloric deficit. So you do need to know how much you're eating and how much energy you're expend spending. And again, with this age, sex, activity, there's a lot of different things that go into it. So it, it's, it's, it's really very individual and something you've kind of got to figure out for yourself and find that sweet spot. Like I said, I mean, I tried for almost three years. I mean... My health did tank um, at one point, but yeah, I couldn't find anything. And it, it just took me a long time to finally find what switched for me. But like I say, I'm going into menopause and I was 16 pounds overweight and I, I couldn't find something that worked, but I did. So it worked for me. So again, with that, we need to look at insulin and we need to look at the cortisol. Again, these are the big two. Obviously, like I say, sex hormones and other hormones do have an effect on that. So from that point of view, insulin, so again, we want to reduce insulin spiking as much as we can. So again, we need to look at the diet. So simple carbohydrates need to disappear. We need to probably look at more comp complex carbohydrates and also proteins and healthy fats to, again, to stop those insulin spikes because we need that insulin reducer to keep that fat cells rolling. And as going again, going back into menopause, like we need healthy starches and healthy dietary fats to help produce estrogen. So a lot of like women going into uh, menopause are thinking, oh, go low carb, go low fat, and it's the worst thing you can do. Yes, yeah, so not all carbs are created equal, yeah. as again we've spoke about in different podcasts. Cortisol again, we want to reduce that cortisol as much as we can because again, it is a stress. That stress hormone will drive fat into the cells and it will stop that fat burning process. So again, once it's mobilized, it can get pushed back in again. And cortisol is one of those big drivers. So reducing stress as much as you can. As we said in the stress podcast, you're not going to stop stress. It's more stress management and it's more coping with stress and then not getting wound up about things and plus also one of the worst things is chronic stress so chronic stress being that you don't get out of that stressful situation you just keep going with it short bursts of stress that's that's life you know what I mean it is what it is and we get short bursts of stress but it's when we kind of mull over things and then we have these things that constantly nag away at us that again that could not me not me never <laughs> that can really really kind of uh, exacerbate that response and just keep it on the back burner and it's not always a case of managing the stress it's actually looking at what's causing you the stress in the first place still not you still not me so still not me <laughs> so with that again just to try to get that fat mobile obviously if you've got 30 pounds 40 pounds of fat to lose uh, that's an awful lot of calories so if you times 40 by 3500 you're going to get the approximate caloric value don't bother here. It doesn't no, no, matter. no, no, I need to oh, know. Oh, you need that. to know now. I need okay. to know. That's, um, oh, uh, 140,000 so calories. So if you've got 40 <laughs> pounds of fat to lose, that's 140,000 calories. So that's an awful lot of energy you've got stored up. And I mean, it's a, it's a very good source of energy. Uh, but if you're just eating to your caloric level every day, uh, like we spoke about in the last podcast, you're not going to get through that 140,000 calories. So you need to do something. And exercise is obviously one way of help reducing those calories. And like we said, going and killing yourself on a treadmill or in a workout isn't going to help because, again, you, you're heightening stress and you're not utilizing the proper fuel substrate. So as we're going to say again, walking, <laughs> things like that. But again, walking when you're actually exercising, walking so you are, you know, not out of breath, but your heart rate's elevated, things are moving. And that is the ideal scenario for those uh, lipids that are floating around in your bloodstream to actually get used. One of the best ways is actually to get do like a, a fairly higher intense workout, which um, start off with probably 10, 15, 20 minutes of like really kind of working hard. Burpees. Get, bur burpees, yeah. 20 minutes of burpees. Getting yourself out of breath 
And then once you're in that situation, what happens then is you've started to increase those blood lipids floating around in your system. So if you actually stopped working out after doing that and then went and ate something, all those blood lipids that are floating around your system go back through that re-esterification re process and get put back into the cells. Fat in, fat out, fat in, fat out. So you, what you actually got out, you just put in back. If you actually went for a walk or did something after that workout, then those fatty lipids that are floating around your system that you've actually mobilized actually get used. So, de so delay delay what you eat after a you, high yeah, intense interval. Yeah, delay what you eat and then go and exercise or just do a lower intensity workout. So a, a brisk walk for half an hour after doing that will really, really help pick all those lipids up. And like we say, there's 140,000 calories you've got to rump through for if you want a 40 pound fat loss. And I mean, a 40 pound fat loss probably equates to around a 50 to 60 pound weight loss because fat cells will hold a lot of water. So as you're shrinking those fat cells, which again, you're not getting rid of, you're just shrinking them, that water will come out into your system too. Obviously as well, if you as you're 40 pounds lighter, your muscle density needs to reduce a little bit. So your legs don't need to be quite as strong. So muscle mass will reduce a little bit. So that goes up into that 60 pounds of possible weight loss. And as I said earlier about that Biggest Loser um, article, that your leptin signaling is going to be diminished as well. So when you have a lot of empty fat cells, like just be very conscious of your lifestyle changes after you've lost a significant amount of weight. And if you've been overweight, prior and you want to lose that weight remember your you, your body will remember that and you will be for i think i think it's five years in that first five years which again is a why a lot of people put weight back on afterwards you're predisposed to want to put that weight back on because again your body's got what they call this set point and your body's happy at that at that level it's got used to being at that level and with this set point level your body's going to want to go and put this weight back on because it was happy there. And it takes a long time for your body to get out of that cycle of wanting to be in that set point. So it will have to, it will take time. And it's like being an alcoholic or being a smoker. I mean, alcoholics and smokers don't just nip down the bar or just buy a <laughs> packet of cigarettes after, you know, after they've stopped. I'll just have one glass of wine yeah, and one, one glass, cigarette. And I'm sure I'll be fine. <laughs> it, it doesn't happen. So if you've lost weight, basically that's what you kind of saddle with for the rest of your days is you've got to be forever vigilant that that weight will probably want to come back on. It's sad, but that, I mean, that's the truth of the matter. You've kind of predisposed yourself. And there's a lot of different epigenetic things. We've spoke about epigenetics too. And I mean, even from being uh, in the womb right up to where you are now, there's epigenetics that can have effects on how we store fat, how we partition our fuel sources and how we utilize fuel, which again can play into uh, a lot of these different things. And it, there's no easy quick answer. And you told me about something that you read about the, was it the concentration camps? where no. the, They were like, like starved and then no the <laughs> <laughs> it, what happened it was um it was 1944-45 and, and in holland basically the german army cut off a lot of the ration supplies to uh these places in holland and the people in there ended up in a famine and it, i think it was called the dutch famine uh the second world war dutch famine or something like that. if you google it you'll find it and what happened after that is because it was kind of a really unique uh opportunity i guess i mean people sadly but 20 odd thousand people sadly died but the the people in a normal western area who were used to having good amounts of food were starved for about a year and a, a lot of people to say died but, but women were pregnant and stuff so uh, i think it was a university from the uk and a university from holland actually studied the people right up until 2005 or 2008 looking at how their children were afterwards, how they were afterwards. And again, these people that were starved, their kids were actually ended up, a lot of them ended up obese because in the womb, they'd been pre-programmed that you're going to come out of the room with the womb and through epigenetics, uh, basically eat and store all the fat you can because there's a famine going on. And we, and it's, it was an amazing thing to just read and look up about it. So yeah, it's the, the Dutch famine of 44 or something like 45. And again, Google it, have a look at it. And it just shows how 
from again from a, a systematic point of view we can be pre-programmed to do these things and again the body's just looking to survive then it thinks it's born being born into this certain environment and it whether they weren't which kind of made it a unique situation so with that again i think we've uh, tried to cover everything again trying to get fat in fat out of the system and like i say it is a battle in some ways and you really again as we've said before everybody's different and you've kind of got to find out what works for you like we've said at the start of the podcast next week we're going to chat about the thyroid and all things thyroid and in in the outro for the episode we do ask people if they could you know leave us a review on itunes and we haven't got one yet and somebody <laughs> we, said we have another listener so yes We're, somebody yeah. said the other day that they're a listener so that's nine so i mean if you do leave us a review we might get into double figures which kind of we may have a party we honestly uh, don't know how many we've got <laughs> We might, we might have a party or something. Woo-hoo. There you go. So, yeah, if you want to leave us one on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever else you can leave reviews, as long as you don't say we're crap, then don't bother leaving one. Yeah, don't leave one. Just say we're really great and you love us. Yeah. Next week, the thyroid. See you then. That's all we have time for right now, but we do hope that you join us for our next show. And if you want to contribute to an upcoming show by suggesting a topic that you would like us to discuss in more detail, then hop over to our website, healthyhalfhourpodcast.com, subscribe to our podcast and submit your suggestions. The Healthy Half Hour Podcast was brought to you by The Seven Day Shred. And don't forget to share our details with your friends and review our show. Until next time, thanks for listening.